Hey everyone, it's Denise Brown from the Caregiving Years Training Academy. I am thrilled and delighted to introduce you to another workshop leader at our upcoming conference, the Caring Conference, Our Resilient Spirit. Beth Surratt is going to present on Saturday, April 10th around Decision Day. Oh my gosh, when we are facing really life altering decisions because we're in a caregiving situation, it is oppressive to figure out what's the right decision. So tell us why you wanted to talk about decision day as it relates to resilience. Sure, so first of all, thank you for having me today. I am very excited about this weekend and talking about this at length. So I wanted to talk about it uh, in relation to resilience because we had been down, my sister and I were a team taking care of my dad for five years. And we had been down such a path of complications and conditions and surgeries that we were worn down. And facing what looked one way or another was going to be the very end of my dad's life felt unbelievably daunting. And we had to make a decision about what whether he was going to have a surgery or not, and what would happen as a result of each of those things. And so when you've got that sort of depleted supply of mental and emotional energy, it's very hard to enter into that decision-making. But what we finally realized uh, with the help of a great oncologist who kind of gave us, helped us shift into you know, this different perspective was that it is all in the perspective. We didn't understand that there comes a time or there can come a time when you do need to shift from that intense drive to cure, which is what we had every step of the way with my dad, to realizing that this is the time to make that shift. You're not going to try to control everything. You're not going to be fixing everything. You need to move into, okay, this is the end piece of my dad's life. And we just want to make sure that he's comfortable until the end. And so that gave us, that was like that, shift was the resilience. And we then entered into that last piece of his life with such a different mental energy, physical, emotional energy. It was a completely different experience from anything that had come before. We, we came at the whole situation with sort of, you know, feeling empowered and understanding what we needed to do at this point and to help him have the end of life experience that he had always wanted. And we were successful and I am grateful for that to this day. In the six stages concept that I developed, it's that transitioning caregiver stage where you transition from doing to being which is, I think, so important to know that it's okay to stop doing because you can overdo. Of course, the healthcare system doesn't make that decision easy because they're gonna always give you an option to continue to do. <laughs> here's another treatment, here's another cure, here's another specialist you could see. So how do you weigh in others' suggestions on decision day? and know whether or not those are really appropriate decisions or appropriate suggestions. Yeah, so part of it is gut feeling. We knew that the, the information that we were getting about rec a recommendation for my dad to have two different surgeries. He was 86, he had dementia, he didn't remember my mother he'd been married to for 50 years. Um, so it was, um, it was understanding where the recommendations were coming from. So we had a um, cardiac surgeon making a recommendation. And when I finally kind of got down to the nitty gritty, he said really ultimately when I pushed that there was about a 5% chance that this, these two surgeries were going to cure my dad's cancer. And you know, to what end would he make it through one much less two surgeries? What would his quality of life be if he did? And so then the oncologist who understands how to manage end of life, who knows how to manage cancer situations, especially with older adults, he listened to what my dad's lifelong wishes had been expressed wishes about the end of life and, and approaches that he wanted and approaches that he didn't want. So it was all about where, you know, the source of the information and friends and family, some people who didn't understand, who didn't have a family caregiving experience really wouldn't understand the actual decision that we need to make that we needed to make and what went into it. And so people who had had a family caregiving experience 
had much better sort of insights into what we were doing and gave us some great feedback. So definitely keeping in mind the source of the information and what their incentives are and where kind of where they're heading with whatever it is that they do and their focus. So, you know, kind of weighing all those out and with that gut feeling, you'll know. Yeah, I like this idea that what a doctor may recommend is the first say. <laughs> and you go from that first say into research mode. And then you get feedback from others, and it could be other professionals, other individuals in your life, knowing that you have the final say. So whatever the doctor recommends is where you start, but where you end is when you make the decision that's right for your care for that particular situation. Right. And some physicians are really very focused on curative care and don't have much experience with end of life care or sort of delving into the details of it. And like that oncologist, that was a part of, you know, having cancer, there's always sort of that look at where is the end of life related to this. And so it was a very different look at the, you know, assessment of the situation. So the assessment needs to take in all kinds of viewpoints and then you make your decision. I wonder if you could give us a perspective on our gut is telling us that decision day has arrived and it is time for us to think about end of life. And it's something that we want to put off. We know it's, it really is decision day, but our denial is tempting us to say, you know what, don't jump the gun. Give it another day. Give it another 24 hours. Give it another week. Give it another month. And we could really buy into that kind of narrative. How do we, though, then say, okay, that's denial talking. The reality is this is the day to decide. Well, that is a very good question. It, it will be sort of uh, pushed by the need to make decisions where a physician is looking for an answer. Are you going to go with this approach or not? I have an opening where I can do this surgery on Thursday. If you don't take that opening, then it's not until 10 days from now and who knows what you know your dad's condition could be by then. So those are sort of external factors. But um, so kind of that facing of reality, it's hard and it's definitely influenced by other people where I maybe had a pretty good uh, sort of sense of reality and ability to deal with mortality and those sorts of things where other people will fight tooth and nail until the bitter end, which I have seen as a uh, volunteer at a family caregiver center at a hospital. There were definitely factions of families sort of, you know, where this one was saying absolutely everything until the very last second. And this one was saying, look, uh, you know, that's just going to cause pain and discomfort. Not sure you're really understanding all the ramifications of going that route. And so when you sort of get to those, well, what are the ramifications and what really is entailed in extending life as long as possible? And is another day going to make a big difference is another week versus the quality of that time. And so when you start looking at that quality of life versus what's really entailed in the treatment, um, that's when you'll kind of get a crystallization. And when you, especially when you start having a discussion with a physician about this, because a lot of physicians don't want to talk to families about it. They're not comfortable. They're not trained. They're not, it's not their focus. Um, and they can sense discomfort from a family member. And so they don't want to have a, you know, a, a, a sort of, uh, you know, uncomfortable conversation with a family member. But if it's amazing how many times if you talk to your Carrie's doctor and say, here's my situation, here's where I'm waffling, you'll get a very different response a lot of times that will help you understand where to go and when. So I had a colleague whose mother died last month. And it was a back and forth around palliative care and hospice care. And ultimately they decided, let's start with palliative care and move into hospice care. Her mom was 93 with advancing cancer and was in a, in a situation where her body was starting to shut down. So she certainly qualified for hospice. And the family's decision meant moving into palliative care thinking they had plenty of time 
to switch then to hospice. And the one regret that my colleague had was that the priest was never able to come and see her mom her last rites, which as a Catholic, it's one of our, what's the word that we use for that? It's not ritual, it's one of our, what is? Um, sacraments. Yes, sacraments. Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> I am too, but I'm not practicing apparently. Okay, so it's one of our sacraments. It's very important, especially if you are a practicing Catholic to receive last rites. And so that was her regret. I, I, I thought about that and I thought, I wonder if, they had made that decision, it's hospice. The reality is she's 93 with advancing cancer, it is hospice. If that would have then kind of pushed along the, you know what, we just don't know how much time. So what the heck, it doesn't matter if she lives another three months, let's get that priest in now. Let's just do what we can to make sure that all her final wishes are met. And I'm wondering how you, how you Think of that story when I, when I share it. What comes to mind for you? What comes to mind to me is that I am very thankful that I don't have any regret about that because we did actually bring a priest because my dad had always expressed that that's what he wanted at the end of life. And so we weren't really, and my dad's uh, decline was so fast at the end. You know, a week before he died, we were out to lunch. And so when we sort of first got an inkling that there was this big decline over a couple of days, we said, okay, you know, let's do it just in case. And again, if he lived, if he rallied out of this somehow and you know, there was a big change, well, okay, it wasn't going to hurt anything. And so uh, err on the side of caution. And yeah, so, but I, you know, I'm all about preparation and, and sort of going to taking the steps rather than hesitating. So it, a lot of it depends on your kind of natural approach that way. But the big piece of this is that you, is the regret piece. And that I'm all about this. Um, you know, it's my motto is plan and prepare or react and regret. Those are pretty much the two choices. But if you're reacting in the moment, just, you know, sort of put yourself down the line after this is all over, where, where, where are you going to be in your mind? will you have regret? So kind of with the approach of, okay, how can we all have the least regret possible? Is it kind of, is one good lens to look at the whole situation through? And I do think that there sometimes is this default of, let's just wait and see, let's just wait and see. The reality is sometimes you wait and see, and then you think, oh my gosh, we waited too long. And if you do something like have last rights, and then your carry continues to live for another six months or a year, you can call that a miracle, that you would <laughs> visit upon a miracle. It was not anything that was wasted. And I think about saving the weight for the DMV, you know, that's where you wait. But don't wait around really making a decision that ensures your carry's quality of life, ensures that his or her wishes are implemented and ensures that you have really good memories about, oh my gosh, we did, we did all this for him or her. Yeah, I have such an, uh, and my father passed away five years ago, but I have such a sense of peace and calm as a result of his end of life experience, but we got there painfully. And so, which is why I'm here today and doing what I do for my job now to help people have an easier time for that and to get to that sort of a conclusion because I've seen the other way and it's it's bad, really just heartbreaking. And so to have any sort of guidance in how to approach the end of life for your carry can just make an unbelievably enormous difference for everyone, you, your carry, your entire family, yeah. So Beth, your presentation is on Saturday, April 10th. So for those who'd like to join you, they can go to carryingourway.com to see the full agenda. And remind me what time your workshop is. I am drawing. Oh, goodness. And I'm okay, not going to okay. throw that off the top of my head. I'm sorry. That's okay. Yes, I think I'm the next to last one though. Okay, so that uh, would be Saturday afternoon. Yes. Just put it in that window. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll see a whole, really amazing lineup of workshops around resilience on April 9th and 10th. We've got really great presenters. The cost is free. 
if you're interested in receiving CEUs because you're a nurse or a certified dementia practitioner or a certified senior advisor, you can actually receive up to 12 CEUs for a flat fee of 20 bucks. So go to caringourway.com to see our full agenda. You can register there if you'd like, and then you'll receive a reminder for the different workshops that you'd like to attend. We'd love to have you join us. Okay, Beth, thank you so much. For those who'd like to be in touch with you, what's your website address? It's caregivingpathways.com. Okay, thanks everybody so much for watching. I'm Denise Brown, take care. See you on Friday and Saturday, April 9th and 10th. Bye-bye everyone.